During the Second World War, the United States experienced a revolution in tank design and production. As Hitler's army swept through Europe, America transformed itself from an isolationist backwater to an industrial giant, producing vast numbers of tanks to challenge the Axis forces. Its war-winning weapon was the Sherman. On the 15th of September 1916, the British Army unleashed a secret arsenal of devastating weapons. The German press called them the Devil's Coaches, but back in Britain they were heralded as the key to winning the war. Many soldiers shared this belief and were willing to endure toxic fumes, deafening noise and poor visibility to use this new weapon, the tank. Unlike France and Britain, by 1917, America had not developed its own tanks, nor had it been exposed to tank warfare before it joined the Allies on the Western Front. But US generals did draw one definite conclusion from what they had seen on the battlefields of Northern France. The experience that the Americans brought back from the First World War was that the tank existed to support the infantry. And that's essentially what it was used for in the First War. So all the American thought, doctrine, development goes into an infantry tank. It, it's taken to such an extreme that in 1920, the Americans abolished the tank corps and they hand over tanks and tank development to the infantry. Aircraft are coming to the fore at the end of the Great War. Both the US Army and the US Navy are trying to develop air power. And so there's lots of inter-service rivalry and lots of the limited money that's available goes towards air power rather than towards armour. So during the 1920s and 30s, tank development was not considered a priority. Some prototypes were developed, but even these were subject to severe constraints. American tank development really is stagnant uh, until the 1930s. Uh, even then, when they start to think again about tank development, they still can't produce anything which is more than about 15 tonnes in weight because that's what American bridging equipment will take. By the late 1930s, America's tank arsenal consisted of a few hundred light tanks left over from the First World War. Although there was no pressure to kickstart medium tank development, designers did look at the latest technologies. Right up to the outbreak of the war in September of 1939, uh, American armoured forces are very much focused on light tanks. And in fact, they passed up, really, um, the J. Walter Christie suspension system, which, of course, appeared on the, in, in the medium tank range. The Christie suspension was actually a pretty good system. Uh, the British used it for one of their tanks, and, and the Dutch used it. The Americans didn't probably because it was a little bit over-engineered. In some ways, it was a bit ahead of its time. Uh, also, it was very noisy and squeaky. So the element of secrecy would have been lost if you'd used Christie suspension. As the US government struggled with the Great Depression during the 1930s, military spending slumped even further. With less money to go round, the US Army favoured light tanks because they were cheaper to produce and because they could replace the cavalry horse. The two cavalry divisions by the early 1930s had realised that cavalry had probably had its day. Uh, well, they were very reluctant about that. But for them, obviously, that meant that uh, cavalry's primary function of going rapidly behind enemy lines, disrupt, you know, disrupting enemy communications, uh, that could be best served through a light tank. And that's what, of course, America went for, which was the M2, 
uh, which could travel at 37 miles per hour, but was very much undergunned and very much under armoured. So although, as I say, it was good on Blitz, it wasn't very good on Krieg at the end of the day. It's very good on the sort of speed factor. So by 1939, the US finally had its own tank ready for production and a mechanised cavalry brigade was created. Amid intelligence of a newly formed German tank division, there was pressure for the brigade to be organised along the same lines. But American generals did not see war as an imminent threat. In the late summer of 1939, Germany stunned the world by invading Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland. By the summer of 1940, the Germans had invaded the Low Countries and had completely annihilated the French forces. The British, who fought alongside the French, were forced to abandon their tanks on the beaches at Dunkirk. Nobody could understand how Germany managed to crush its opponents when its tanks were no stronger than those of Britain or France. The reason the Germans do so much better than the British or the French is not because they've got more tanks, not because they've got better tanks, but because they know how to use them as part of an integrated whole. And that lesson is taken up by the British, passed on to the Americans. The other lesson is that it's no good having a nippy little tank with very little armour and a pea shooter for a gun. You needed a tank with a decent punch, and it needed to have sufficient armour to withstand what the Germans were going to throw at you. Across the Atlantic, the shock waves were just starting to be felt. It was clear that if America was to enter the war, it would need a tank that could at least match the German Panzer Mark III. The M2 was not nearly capable of doing this. But after losing nearly all of its tanks at Dunkirk, Britain also needed to re-equip its armoured divisions as soon as possible. America, with its huge steelworks and car factories, was perfectly equipped to produce tanks on a mammoth scale. So funds were made available to design the successor to the M2. But the German army had already started to upgrade the Panzer III. For the Allies, time was running out. The Panzer III was no better than anything that the British or the French had in 1940. In fact, in many ways, it wasn't as good. Uh, similarly, there weren't a huge number of them. Um, and it was very quickly superseded by the, the Mark IV, which was a much better tank. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the three that was the first tank that the, the Germans had really in, in major numbers, in, in, in industrial type production. It enabled them to, to train, to get accustomed to using armour. Certainly German tanks were not as heavily armoured, and the 37mm German gun had no advantages whatsoever over the British two-pounder. In fact, the two-pounder was slightly superior. So in, in 1940, the, the Panzer III didn't seem such a threat, but it rapidly became one, because like the um, Panzer IV, it was capable of being rapidly upgunned, and this is in fact what started to happen. I think it was realised by, by some people that it was the way we were using them that was wrong, uh, as opposed to the tanks themselves. Um, people were very reluctant to accept that, it is always very difficult to say that something you have believed in for years, that you have trained for, you have practiced, is actually not correct. And it took quite a lot of time for people to realize that it wasn't just that German tanks were better, which as the war goes on, they become, they weren't at the beginning of the war, German tactics were better. By April 1941, a new medium tank was leaving the production line. Named after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, the M3 had a seven-man crew 
In addition to its 75mm gun, the M3 also mounted a 37mm gun as well as four machine guns. Its armor was up to 37mm thick. Its right radial engine gave it a 340 brake horsepower, a range of 120 miles and a top road speed of 26 miles per hour. Under the Lend-Lease policy, the UK bought 600 M3 tanks and called them the General Grant. The main selling point of the M3 was a much heavier armament to match the German tanks, which had proved so successful in the battle for France. The main gun was not mounted in the turret, but in a sponson on the right-hand side of the hull, but it could only move 15 degrees up and down. When the Lee Grant comes in, it, it, it's always been the concept that as soon as we have a turret that can take a 75mm gun, that is what we move on to. So in a sense, Lee Grant was always a stopgap. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Lee Grant played a crucial part in the North African campaign earning the title Egypt's Last Hope. But it proved unable to deal with the Panzer IV and was eventually replaced by the Sherman. Its wartime career did not end there, though. In 1944, a number of Lees were sent to the mountainous jungles of Burma, where they helped the Allies defeat the Japanese army. By 42, we desperately needed a proper turret-mounted 75mm gun. 75mm being the smallest size, really, that could fire a practically useful um, high-explosive shell. It, it had to have a punch. Not only did it have to have a punch, but it had to have a range. One of the problems of, of all British tanks was that they didn't have the protection that they needed against the equivalent German tanks, and they didn't have a gun that would go through German armour. So, so all the time our thinking is we need more armour, we need a bigger gun. That isn't as easy as it sounds because bigger gun, more armour means more weight, therefore means more powerful engine, might mean less manoeuvrability. What the Allies needed was a tank that could be built in large numbers by a civilian workforce. Not only did it need to be effective in battle, but it needed to be easy to operate and maintain. So designers came up with a medium tank they hoped would fit the bill. The Americans called it the M4, but the British named it the Sherman. Well, I mean, it really replaces the Grant. It, it, it comes along as, you know, the successor to the Grant, as the medium infantry tank for the US Army. And it's going to be the most important tank manufactured in the United States, and one of, one of the most important tanks of World War II. The M4, or Sherman, medium tank, had a five-man crew. Beside its main 75mm gun in the turret, the Sherman also mounted three machine guns, as well as a 50.8mm smoke mortar. Its armour was up to 100mm thick. Its Ford V8 engine meant it was capable of a range of 100 miles, a brake horsepower of 500 and a top road speed of 26 miles per hour. I think the thing about the Sherman was that it conflates in many ways the idea of a light tank and a medium tank into one tank. And that's one of its great selling features, um, I think, for both the British and, and ultimately for the Americans. The Sherman uses quite a lot of the Lee Grant features. It uses the same suspension, initially uses the same engine, uh, uses the same transmission. The big difference is that the Sherman has a cast iron and later a welded hull which is much safer than having one that's, that's riveted. The only real differences were the deletion of the escape hatches, which provided a weakness in the armour, um, which were rapidly recognised, actually. You wanted, instead of having a be you know, increasing crew survival by, by enabling them to get out, probably better if the shell didn't get in in the first place. With orders pouring in, US tank factories were under enormous pressure to produce Shermans quickly, cheaply, and in large numbers. 
Although the Chrysler plant in Detroit was geared up for mass production, many factories had to be built from scratch. And because the Sherman inherited many features of the Lee Grant, existing assembly lines could be easily adapted without causing a drop in production. I think that the thing about the Sherman tank as well is that it's a reliable tank that could be manufactured relatively easily, in fact very easily. And we can see that by the numbers that are produced. Um, some historians have put the figures as around about 49, 50,000, but there are figures which claim as many as 58,000 of these tanks were produced. Either way, they, pr they produced more Shermans in the United States than the entire German wartime production of tanks. The Sherman tank entered service with the British 8th Army in Egypt in the autumn of 1942. After months of bitter fighting against Rommel's army, the men were demoralised and exhausted. The British general Montgomery faced a bleak situation. He needed to prepare his men to stage a final battle to kick the Axis out of Egypt once and for all. The arrival of 300 Shermans could not have been more timely. I mean, the Sherman performs very well in the Western Desert. There are already Sherman tanks with the British Eighth Army at El Alamein, and they do, you know, they do extremely well. And they're clearly a match for any of the Italian tanks, and and also I would argue for most of the German armour that's in the theatre as well. So it starts off well with its 75mm uh, gun and a reliable engine and uh, a, a technically and, and mechanically a reliable tank. The Sherman arrives just in time for the Second Battle of Alamein, and in fact there are 300 of them when that battle starts, and they were generally welcomed. Everybody said, whoopee, at last we've got a decent tank. Very quickly, Montgomery is writing to the war office saying, this new miracle tank isn't actually all it's cracked up to be because it's only just a match for the Mark IV. And given that German tactics at this stage are still a lot better than ours are, the Mark IV versus the Sherman, the Mark IV will generally win. Well, when the Sherman started to enter service, um, really the Panzer III, which was one of the principal threats that had been taken into account when it, when it was being designed, was becoming obsolete and was being replaced by the later versions of the Panzer IV with the long-barreled gun. This immediately put the Sherman to a disadvantage because the Sherman only had a short to medium length weapon at the time, didn't have the muzzle velocity. But as crews got to know the Sherman's strengths, they also discovered its limitations. I think right from the beginning, um, it was realized that the high silhouette of the Sherman was a disadvantage. Now, admittedly, at least did have its main armament in the turret on the top, which the Grant or the Lee Grant did not. But even so, it was still a very high tank, and that was undoubtedly a disadvantage. Um, how did the crews cope with it? They learned how to use ground. They learned how to camouflage. Perforce, they had to. The high turret was never good. In some respects, in the open desert, you could see a tank anyway. It didn't really matter how high it was. The moment you're moving into more undulating terrain, the Sherman is less able to make use of small undulations than lower tanks are. The high silhouette of the Sherman is a problem. It's a, high, it's a problem for any tank design, and particularly when you've got very effective German anti-tank defences, and the 88mm is a very effective weapon. This whole profile of the Sherman is a problem for it and in part it's going to account for the, the losses that it's going to sustain in combat. One of the biggest problems was that the Sherman was built to withstand 37mm armour-piercing ammunition. But when the Germans started using their 88mm anti-aircraft gun to knock out tanks, the Sherman's thin armour made it extremely vulnerable to catching fire. This weakness earned the Sherman unfortunate nicknames. The Germans called it the Tommy Cooker, and the Allies called it the Ronson after the lighter because it always lit first time. <laughs> 
the Sherman had one weakness that it was famous for, and, it, and, and this was as, as tank crews say, its ability to br brew up, this catch fire. Um, the battlefields were quite often littered with burning Shermans, quite a distinctive and very distressing sight. What the Sherman's problem was, was the ammunition stowage. The ammunition was, was stowed too high up, and what tended to happen is that either a penetrating tank hit, or indeed in some places just a tank hit on the outside of the hull, would transmit shock through and it would rupture the cordite propellant, and that would catch fire and cause terrible fires. Despite these problems, British and American crews had many reasons to be pleased with the Sherman. The introduction of the three turret crew on the Sherman, another major factor uh, in its success. It was the key to German success, uh, and once everybody else adopted it, um, the Russians adopted it on the T 3485. The, the whole point of having three crew members was the fact that the loading and firing of the gun were kept separate from the commander. The commander could, could, could direct all his attention to focusing um, the firepower and the maneuver of the tank, fo finding the targets focusing them, doing the manoeuvre, um, and that is the key to successful tank warfare. In December 1941, the United States declared war on the Axis. In what became known as Operation Torch, troops landed in North Africa the following November. But by early 1943, the American army was impatient to take on the Africa Corps, which by this time had been pushed back to Tunisia. By this stage of the long desert campaign, the differences between the hardened British tank crews and their American counterparts really began to show. That um, 50 caliber Browning that they have mounted on the top of the American Shermans, which is ostensibly there is an anti-aircraft weapon. The British say, well, that's no use, we don't want that. <laughs> so they take it off, so they get rid of that. I think the great difference between American and British tank crews on America's entry into the war after the Operation Torch landings in, in North Africa in November 1942 is, of course, the British tank crews by this stage are very experienced and they know what the Germans can do. The American tank crews are inexperienced and have no idea what the Germans can do. And it's because of that inexperience that the Americans have this terrible disaster at Kazarine Pass, which is the first major clash between German armour and American armour, and the Americans come out of it very badly. A thousand men were killed at Kasserine Pass. Hundreds were taken prisoner, and most of their tanks were destroyed. The Americans had relied on the M3 Lee Grant tank during the battle, which proved completely ineffective against the fearsome 88mm anti-tank gun. It was a turning point for the US Army. Commanders were changed, tank strategy was radically transformed, and the Lee Grant was replaced by the Sherman which went on to become the main Allied tank for the rest of the war. Despite losses on some fronts, the adaptability of the Sherman allowed innovation that saved countless lives. One of the most useful variants to emerge from the desert campaign was the Sherman Crab. The Sherman Crab was uh, one of a number of armoured engineering vehicles that started to emerge uh, towards the, the latter part of the Desert War, principally due to the enormous casualties we took in combat engineering during the early part of, of the war and the, the, absolute, the, the essential need to um, provide means of overcoming various obstacles. There were a number of Sherman variants, uh, and one was the, was the crab, as it was known, the flail tank. This had a roller on the front of the tank with, with lengths of chain, um, and it was used for clearing minefields. And, I, and you drove it through the minefield, the flail turned, the pieces of chain beat on the ground in front of it and exploded the anti-tank mines. Very, very simple, but very effective way of, of clearing a lane through a minefield. Very useful in North Africa, where both sides used huge quantities of mines, uh, and equally very useful in uh, Normandy, particularly on, on the D-Day landings, when we had to be able to clear lanes to get tanks off the beach. So, jolly useful bit of kid. In 1943, 
a small Allied force invaded Sicily and over the following months fought its way up Italy's mountainous spine. The rugged terrain favoured German defenders and presented huge challenges to Allied tactics. With the Sherman tank, with its 75mm gun, it could penetrate 3.7 inches of armour plating. The trouble was that both the Panther and the Tiger frontal armour was 4 inches or better. And so in any frontal engagement, the Sherman tank was at a big disadvantage. The, the, the Panther was um, a terrible surprise for the Americans. They really hadn't counted on encountering anything quite as ferocious as that. Um, and their losses against Panthers in, in, in head-on uh, encounters were enormous. Um, at least, the Americans reckoned to lose at least five Shermans for every Panther. The only hope they could have against a, a Mark V would be to sneak up on it um, and try and get it from the rear. Perhaps three or four Shermans might be able to get up behind one Panther. And similarly with the Tiger. Um, if they could get the Tiger with its engine switched off uh, when the Tiger crew then had difficulty in traversing the gun, they might have a chance. But again, it's a question of using a lot of Shermans to take on one Tiger or one Panther but we had plenty of Shermans. The German tank's standard gun was the famous 88mm. It started life as an anti-aircraft gun and was adapted to protect German warships from enemy planes. But the most devastating use for the 88mm was as an anti-tank gun. No other weapon struck fear into the hearts of Allied tank crews in the way the 88 did. No Allied tank could withstand a hit from the 88. This included the Sherman. This particular German officer was an artillery officer. He was in charge of an 88mm gun in Italy covering a, a, a pass, a little gap in the road that, that, that only one tank could come through at a time. And the Americans kept sending a Sherman through each time, and each time the 88 was easily able to destroy it with a single shot. And when asked, well, what happened in the end, he said, well, what happened in the end, we ran out of ammunition and the Americans didn't run out of tanks. And um, that really shows the utility of, of, of being able to mass-produce tanks, but it also shows the awful uh, consequences for, for American tank crews. Italy isn't a good country for tanks, certainly once we get into the mountains. So really the tank in Italy is, is a mobile gun. Um, it's not able to operate uh, widely, it's not able to go for great flanking sweeps because the ground doesn't allow it to. So although we were able to produce far more tanks than the Germans did, our numerical supremacy really was negated by the ground, so it didn't make that much difference. In response to the difficulties faced by the Allies in Italy, attempts were made to improve the Sherman's performance. It's become a piece of folklore in many respects that um, the Sher one of the Sherman's great weaknesses was the fact that it was petrol powered and, and great outcries to why the Americans didn't realise this and, and put a diesel engine in. Well they did, 11,000, over 11,000 Shermans had diesel engines. The US Army then looked into it and decided that because of the type of logistics they would need for, for Normandy, they couldn't afford to have two lots of fuel supply. Early in 1944, preparations started for an invasion of Normandy. The Italian campaign told the Allies to expect unforgiving terrain and more Tiger and Panther tanks. So America considered producing a heavy tank called the M6. But making this new model would mean changing assembly lines and causing production levels to drop. The Allies were left with little choice but to upgrade the Sherman. There was real concern in both Britain and the United States and I think uh, a number of senior people were very worried that in fact America had not gone ahead with the design of the M6 and it was produced a very 
heavy battle tank of perhaps 50 tons or so that could have competed with the Panther and the Tiger tank. But they're stuck with the medium Sherman. And so the only solution they can come up with really in relation to that is obviously to put an improved gun on the Sherman. This new upgunned Sherman was called the Firefly. It had a five-man crew. Its main armament was the British 17-pounder gun, and it also mounted a machine gun. Its armor was up to 89 millimeters thick. Powered by an A57 multi-bank engine, the Firefly had a range of 100 miles, a brake horsepower of 425, and a top road speed of 25 miles per hour. Obviously by 1944, when we get to Normandy, there is a major problem uh, with the Normandy campaign. It really, Normandy is a place, although the beaches are ideal for invasion, once you get off the beaches, the French Bocage country clearly favours the defender. Uh, you have these earthen banks with uh, stout hedging on the top of them and the Germans of course are able to place uh, you know, mechanised infantry with anti-tank weapons behind those kinds of defensive perimeters and backed up, up of course by Tiger tanks and Panther tanks and so Sherman losses began to rise uh, steeply in this attritional warfare. Despite the difficult terrain, the Firefly performed well, and its bigger gun worked wonders for British morale. The Firefly was the one Allied tank that had a chance with a Panther and could even take on a Tiger if it was lucky. Um, all the Firefly was was a bog-standard Sherman, but instead of the 75mm gun, it had a British 17-pounder gun put in the turret. The Firefly was a, was a tremendously effective weapon to such an extent that the Germans told their tank crews always to, to attack it, which led to the, um, rather, the rather interesting um, experiment, that later became very, very standard, of actually painting the end of the barrel pale blue with a brown underneath so that it looked like it was a short barrel. Um, it actually works, works surprisingly well. It worked as far as the British were concerned, and they did have one Firefly in each troop of four tanks. So you had three ordinary Shermans with a 75mm and a Firefly with a 17-pounder. Excellent gun that could take on a German tank. The Americans didn't uh, take that up. Uh, they preferred to use their own uh, American 76mm gun, which actually wasn't as good. The Americans didn't want um, big guns put in tanks. They wanted possibly big guns put in tank destroyers, but they had their own designs of big gun which they thought would be perfectly adequate. They hadn't factored in the Panther into this at all. Le Leslie McNair didn't want to put bigger, bigger guns in. He was, he was greatly opposed to putting even the American 76mm high velocity gun into a tank. And it was, wasn't really until after he got killed um, in a blue-on-blue in a -blue accident by the um, United States Army Air Corps um, when he was visiting the front in, uh, in Normandy, that really that this whole log jam got cleared. In June 1944, Allied troops mounted an invasion of Normandy in northwestern France. Although the Firefly performed well, its armor was too thin to withstand heavy fire from German tanks. I mean, I think, obviously, when we get to 1944 and we get into Normandy, the technical disparities between the German uh, tanks and the M4 Sherman are quite significant in terms of armour as well as in terms of, of the actual gun that's mounted. And although the Firefly addresses the, the gunnery issue up to a point, uh, it cannot address the armour protection issue. And so Shermans are still being, uh, being destroyed uh, you know, in great numbers. <laughs> 
This problem prompted the development of the T-14, otherwise known as the Jumbo. Besides having much thicker armor, it also had extra wide tracks. But the thicker armor made it virtually impossible for mechanics to get to its moving parts. Despite this drawback, 250 were sent to Europe, and they were welcomed by the troops. The Sherman Jumbo was a vastly up-armoured Sherman that was specially produced uh, and, and used in Normandy. Um, it wasn't used extensively as, as a replacement for the Sherman. Um, the up-armouring had, had uh, sort of overstressed the suspension and the transmission, and therefore it was only for use in limited numbers in, in limited situations. But it was very, very popular with the troops. It was essentially used to, to, to lead tank formations, but in particular in, in, in the Bocage, in areas where they might be um, ambushed as a lead tank that, that would be able to take a fair amount of German anti-tank fire and, and, and not succumb to it. But it, it couldn't be used as a main, a main tank because it was really too heavy for the transmission and suspension. I think around 250 were built. Um, there were never enough of them. So what um, the Americans resorted to doing in Normandy was getting hold of knocked out Panthers and cutting them up and bolting the armor on to the front of Shermans to make these sort of um, replacement jumbos. But US generals knew that the war would be won not only on the battlefield, but in America's tank factories. By 1944, the sheer number of Shermans was starting to tip the balance in favor of the Allies. So sacrificing Sherman production in favor of the less reliable T-14 simply wasn't an option. The thing with the Sherman, we needed so many Shermans that simply, it simply wasn't a matter of, of introducing a new tank. We could incrementally improve the Sherman, but the Sherman it had to be. So, with too few jumbos to go around, Sherman crews had to come up with their own creative solutions to improve the safety of their tanks. They put water jackets round um, the, the, uh, the shells in the, in the upper part of the hull, um, which stopped them um, catching fire. The, the, if the, the, the rack was penetrated, the, the water would, would leak onto the fire and put it out. Also, they added um, what's called a plique armour. They welded patches of armour onto the side of the tank. Um, this had a propensity to fall off after one hit, but one hit, saving you from one hit was quite often quite a good thing anyway. So it, it, it had done its job. Certainly it, the Americans found in, uh, after Normandy that of the Shermans without the, the water jackets on their, uh, the, the water protection to their, to their magazines, um, 60 to 80 percent caught fire when hit and it went down to about 15% when you um, fitted the, uh, the wet protection to the, to the magazines. So that did have a considerable effect and that's propensity for the Sherman to explode in flames. But despite these attempts to improve the Sherman's armor, it was never as protected as the Tiger or Panther, and many of these modifications did little more than improve crew morale. The strength, reliability and maintainability of the Sherman hull and power system meant that it was perfect for conversion to perform engineering tasks. Shermans were rearmed as rocket launchers, flamethrowers, self-propelled artillery and mine layers. For these roles, the tank chassis was adapted to take 105mm howitzers or up to 20 rockets. The flame guns were either the Canadian Ronson design or more commonly adaptations of the crocodile system fitted to the British Churchill tank. The wide range of support variants emphasized the versatility of the Sherman hull. Besides the Sherman crab, some tanks were fitted with Caterpillar bulldozer blades and were used to clear away damaged vehicles from a battlefield or carve a path through obstacles. Others were used to tow damaged vehicles away from the battle zone for repair. The bridge carrier was an important conversion. This involved clamping a mobile assault bridge to the Sherman hull using an A-frame. The carrier would then be lowered into place over the stream or gully and released. The Sherman variants, I mean, I think obviously people are aware of often the flail tanks of the Scorpion and, and uh, of the Crab. Um, but there were two other variants. There was a beach armoured recovery vehicle variant, 
And this was a, a type of shearment that was designed actually to go out into 10 feet of water and recover so-called drowned vehicles, vehicles that had, for some reason or other, ended up in, in, in the drink, as it were. And so it was designed to actually tow them off and, and, and you know, retrieve them, and also actually free up beached landing craft and that kind of thing. So it performed a valuable f function in that kind of capacity. One of the most famous Sherman amphibious conversions was the duplex drive, otherwise known as the DD. The DD was the name given to Sherman's encased in disposable buoyancy tanks. The duplex drive itself was a mechanism that enabled the tank to be driven by conventional tracks and at the flick of a switch by marine propellers. The development of the DD was prompted after a disastrous amphibious landing at Dieppe in 1942. It emerged in time for the D-Day invasion. One of the lessons from the Dieppe raid was that you needed to be able to get armour onto the beach at the same time as the infantry. Now, how did you do that? Well, there were two ways of doing it. You could either put 13, 14 tanks in a landing craft tank, drive it up to the beach and debouch your tanks. Difficulty, the landing ship tank was a huge target. And if it was hit coming in, then you lost all the tanks that were on it. Um, or you could swim in tanks individually, except the tanks can't swim. They're as about as good in the water as a brick. The Normandy invasion saw the first trial of the revolutionary amphibious tank, the DD, or duplex drive quite a frightening concept in many ways. It was developed by the people who make lilos, who invented the lilo. And it, event, and it comprised of, of a screen that was raised upon um, folding, a folding uh, frame. And what it actually did, it was just increase the displacement, the water displacement of the tank, so that it would actually float. The tank was, was waterproofed. But all, all this canvas screen did was increased, and, and the tank sort of floated along um, rather precariously. You have uh, this DD drive, a so-called duplex drive, because on land the tank is still powered in its normal way with its traction. But in water it's powered by two propellers, which actually could make it travel at six miles per hour, providing the water was relatively calm. This is not a, a, a sort of seagoing vessel that you would want to be in in any type of uh, any type of rough weather, which is why they lost so many of them uh, in the actual invasion of Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944, because the channel was still very rough. They were only supposed to be dropped fairly fairly close to the beach. But there was a navigation error. The Americans dropped theirs a long way out. Also, they dropped them at the wrong, at the wrong place along the beach. And the tanks had to turn relative to the tide and the waves um, to try and reach the beach. And they got swamped doing the turn. If they'd been dropped closer in, um, they would have worked quite well. They worked quite well further down the beach. The water simply came across. In some cases, we're talking about a freeboard of only a few inches. So, you know, any kind of sea at all is going to cause a problem here. However, that was offset by the fact that the surprise of the defender suddenly seeing a tank coming ashore, uh, from swimming ashore from sea, um, the actual skirt uh, the sort of, uh, could, was very easy to drop down, and so the tank was almost instantly ready for action. And it certainly had a big psychological impact upon the enemy, seeing something like that being used against them but um, many, many crews perished. They were equipped with submarine escape gear, but how many of them actually managed to use it? Um, very few in number. The Sherman earned its place as the main battle tank of the Second World War. Although not a match for the largest German tanks, its reliability and speed earned it respect among tank crews. Its strong, adaptable hull made it perfect for conversion. But most importantly, its simple design meant that it could be assembled in huge numbers by a civilian workforce who, until 1940, didn't know what a tank was. In the end, the German army just could not fight against the tidal wave of Shermans. It truly was the Allied workhorse that helped win the war. This was a, an exceptionally good, reliable, versatile, medium tank that uh, really did far more 
than one could have expected of one tank design. It, it really was an exceptional tank in terms of the fact that it served throughout really the bulk of World War II uh, and performed in so many different and diverse tasks from really El Alamein in the Western Desert through the Italian campaign, through the invasion of France and, and ultimately into the actual seizure and conquest of, of Germany. So in terms of this as a medium tank, it's clearly one of World War II's finest tanks. It was incredibly reliable, it was capable of being upgunned, it was capable of being up-armoured, um, and in many respects, it was the, fact, the sheer fact that it was available in such numbers, it was such, an, it, it was such a, a producible design. The Sherman was never a terribly good battle tank. It was really only about on a par with the German Mark IV, and that had been superseded twice in the German army. Nevertheless, it was reliable, it was relatively easy to maintain, and because it was produced by industry in 11 different plants, including one in Canada, and using assembly line procedures, it could be produced by the thousand. In fact, 55,000, roughly, of Shermans were built during the war. Yes, it had disadvantages. Its gun wasn't anything like big enough. It wasn't well enough protected. Um, it had a distressing habit to, to blow up. Uh, but because there were so many of them, we win not because it's a better tank, but because we've got far more of them. One Panther might be equivalent to five Shermans, but you're far more likely to have five Shermans on the day than you ever were to have one Panther. <laughs>